During Canada's first national internment operations of 1914 to 1920, several thousand Ukrainians and other Europeans were needlessly imprisoned in what were referred to at the time as concentration camps or internment camps right across Canada. The first thing that happened was that tens of thousands of people were registered as enemy aliens and then from that number a smaller percentage were actually physically arrested and interned in Canadian internment camps right across the country. There are 24 of these camps. In total just over eight and a half thousand people were interned, mainly young men of military age, uh, mainly recent immigrants, but among them there were also some women and children and there were also individuals who were naturalized British subjects, what we would call a Canadian citizen today as well as people who had been born in Canada. Now, there was never any evidence produced, not then, not since, of any disloyalty on the part of these individuals who were interned in Canadian camps. Uh, instead, it was wartime hysteria, prejudice, xenophobia, um, the early months of the war uh, suddenly becoming clear that this war was going to go on a much longer period of time and that it was a vicious conflict that precipitated uh, panic and prejudice to the extent that, as I say, uh, 24 internment camps were established across the country into which these people were placed. The majority were Ukrainians, but there were also other East Europeans, Croatians, Hungarians, Serbians, people who'd come from the multilingual, multicultural, multiracial Ottoman, Austro-Hungarian and German empires. These people had all, it should be pointed out, been lured to Canada with promises of freedom and free land. They did not come to Canada um, because they felt like it. They were actually enticed to come here by promises. If you come to Canada, there are tens upon thousands of acres of free land in Western Canada that if you can farm, you can have. You will find political liberty and freedom in Canada that you don't have in the Austro-Hungarian or German or Ottoman Turkish Empire. So the bait was put out. These people were lured to Canada with all these promises of freedoms. World War I breaks out in August of 1914 and suddenly they find themselves designated as enemy aliens under the War Measures Act and herded into these Canadian internment camps right across the country. What happens next is they are forced to do heavy labor for the profit of their jailers. Some of the internees were actually German and Austrian-German prisoners of war. Those men, so-called first-class internees, were kept in camps like Fort Henry in Kingston or Vernon in British Columbia, where they were forced to maintain order in their camps, but not otherwise forced to work for the profit of their jailers. The vast majority of the people who were interned, however, uh, the so-called second-class prisoners of war, in fact, civilian internees, um, were forced contrary to international conventions at the time, to work for the profit of their jailers. So you see photographs of men working, for example, building the roads in Banff National Park. You see them doing ditch digging. You see them clearing uh, artillery ranges at Petawawa. You see them uh, creating two experimental farms, one at Kaplis Casing, which used to be known as McPherson Station, the other one at Spirit Lake. You see them at the Amherst Iron Works. You see them right across the country doing hard labor being paid a pittance for it compared to what they would have earned on the free market and doing it for essentially the profit of the government of Canada, various provincial municipal governments and, and, and also of course business concerns. So this was a widespread um, internal security measure uh, that really uh, created a crisis, a trauma in the communities that were affected, mainly East European communities, and it was a crippling legacy for those communities well into the future. We've seen documents now that we've found uh, that talk about uh, the uh, way in which the internment operations um, affected these people. For example, uh, there's one RCMP report from the 1940s that talks about how Ukrainians, the leadership of the Ukrainian community in Canada is still quote unquote in fear of the barbed wire fence. Uh, talks about the legacy of the internment operations. So this was um, not only needless, there was no internal security threat in, in fact, but it had a traumatic and long-lasting impact on the Ukrainian and other East European communities. Now we do have some um, quotations from people at the time, and if you'll allow me, I'll just read you one or two. Katie Dimitrik, who was writing to her father, he was originally interned in Lethbridge and then sent to Spirit Lake. Uh, he was a father of four, so here's his, his little girl, age nine, writing to me, uh, to him, and she's you know, writing as a child, a nine-year-old, uh, and this is how she wrote. She said, my dear father, we have not nothing to eat, and they do not want to give us no wood. My mother has to go four times to get something just to eat. 
It is better with you because we had everything to eat. This shack is no good. My mother is going downtown every day and I have to go with her and I don't go to school at winter. It is cold in that shack. We, your small children, kiss your hands, my dear father. Goodbye, my dear father. Come home right away. I mean, how can you not hear that and just sense that poor girl's anguish at her father being removed for no, no good reason at all?